time in which we find ourselves, that we would walk in his plan and purpose and realize his destiny, what he would desire for each and every one of us. Praise God. We began Wednesday night to speak about this man, Habakkuk, in our time together on Wednesday. For those of you who weren't here, I love this prophet. There are a lot of things I like about this prophet. One in particular is the name that was given to him. And his name is very significant because the name Habakkuk means to cling to, to adhere to, to hold fast to. And I like that because it was his experience that he held fast to the hand of God. He clung to God with everything that was within him. And I love that. I love that name. I, I would that God would, would speak of me in that way. This is Habakkuk, my son, the one who adheres to me, the one who clings to me, the one who holds fast to me, the one who cannot be shaken from me because he and I are one. Oh, oh God, I would, I would that God would have that testimony of me. God, that you would know me in that way and that you would see me in that light and that I would see myself in that light and realize this is what God desires for me. He wants more than just a casual relationship. He doesn't want acquaintances. He wants intimate children. Hallelujah. That can, he can share his heart with. Hallelujah. Praise his name. And this young man is looking to receive from God. He's waiting and expecting and longing to meet with God. God is coming. He knows God is coming. He senses in his spirit that something is happening. God's drawing near and he wants to be ready. And so he prepares himself to have an encounter with God. And I love this passage of scripture. It speaks so strongly and profoundly into the time in which we find ourselves now. I told you on Wednesday night that it's time for us to prepare ourselves. That we must recognize that God is calling. He's drawing near. These prayer meetings on Monday night are not just a haphazard. Oh, I think we'll just come in together and, and pray and, you know, have business as usual. Oh, no, no, no. God is moving. God is directing. God is drawing us into that place. For his plan and his purpose, he's about to reveal himself. Are we ready to have that encounter? Are we ready to meet with him when he comes? He's drawing us, leading us, guiding us, directing us, because he's about to fulfill his word. And I want to be a part Thank God we have ears, some of us, who can, that can hear. Some of us who have a spirit that can sense that God is doing something. I'm thanking God that even though I live on the Cape, that I heard enough of the voice of God that I said I'm, I must be there. In New Bedford, I don't know why. Why do I have to go to New Bedford? It doesn't matter, but I'm here, Lord. I'm here because I'm sensing God. I'm, I'm expecting God. I'm believing God. He's drawing, he's leading, he's guiding, and I want to be ready to receive whatever it is that he has for me personally, first and foremost, and collectively that he has for us. His body, hallelujah, praise his holy name. And so the prophet readies himself, he prepares himself, he puts himself upon the rampart, upon the tower, he makes his station there, and he prepares, he readies himself to have an encounter with God, and I love how he prepares himself. There's an expectancy in his preparation, because he knows beyond the shadow of God's coming. Amen. 
<laughs> he's going to come. He's going to meet with me. I'm going to not only hear him, because he says here, I'm waiting and watching. <laughs> I am waiting and watching. Remember Jesus said, watch and pray. <laughs> watch and pray. He's expecting. He knows he's going to hear a word, but he wants to see what God has to say. I love that. He's saying, God, I know when I encounter you, I'm not just going to hear your word. I'm going to feel your heart. I want to know beyond the shadow of a doubt what you feel, what you know. Speak into my spirit so that I can feel what you feel, God. We are connected. We are one. I'm clinging to you. I'm longing for your word. I'm desiring more than anything to encounter you. So, Father, I want to see, to hear, to know, to experience you in all of your glory. So that I may be to the praise and glory of your name. That I may know, that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know. This is the way. Walk ye in it. There's no doubt in my mind. There's no obstacle in my heart. I'm clinging to you with everything that's within me. And I'm desiring God because I know your eternal plan and purpose is about to come to fruition. Your word is going to be established. And so, God comes and speaks to the prophet. And I love what God says. God says to him, the prophet God answers him and says to the prophet in the second verse, write the vision. Make it plain upon the tablets so that whoever reads it, they're going to run. For the vision he said is yet for an appointed time. To everything, Solomon said, there's a time. And a purpose, an intent, a season for everything. There is an appointed time. Everybody say, there's an appointed time. The vision, God says, what I'm showing you, revealing to you, what you're feeling and sensing is yet for the appointed time. It's coming. It's going to tarry a little while, but wait for it, he says. It will surely come. It won't delay. But it is yet for an appointed time. It hastens to its end and it will not lie. I like what this version says. Is if it seems slow, just wait for it, for it will surely come. And in the day of its arrival, it will not. It will not delay. In the time of its coming, it will not Delay. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. And he says, But in the time of the end, ha, 
But at the time of the end, it will speak. Ah, vision is yet for an appointed time, but in the time of the end, it will speak. I want you to, to know we are standing on the threshold of that very time. The time of the end. The end of the age. The culmination of all things. Life as we know it is quickly hastening to its end. God's word is about to be fulfilled. Jesus is coming again. That was a very, very weak amen. I guess nobody believes Jesus is coming. <laughs> Jesus is coming again. Hallelujah. Like he said he would, he's coming again. Very quickly. All things are happening even as he told us in his word they would. We find ourselves in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. In a perplexing and confusing time. In fact, Paul the Apostle, when he looked down the corridor of time, he looked into our day, into our time. Now this amazes me. He looks at my day, at my age, our time, and he says, boy, in that day, perilous times. That's going to be a perilous time. That's going to be a dangerous time. That's going to be a perplexing and a confusing time. More than any other time on the face of the earth, that time. My day, this day, our time. Because he said men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Self-seeking, self-serving, living for themselves. The me generation, you have, how many times have we heard that? The me generation, the my generation, the I generation. It's all about me. Men will be lovers of themselves. And so much so that Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, is he even going to find faith on the earth? Even amongst those who call themselves by his name, will he really find faith? a faithful and true witness. Many are given over to the spirit of the world. Falling in love with the here, the now, the natural, the world, the things in the world, longing and desiring the things in the church. I'm talking to the church this morning. I'm not talking about the world. We know the world is not saved. Hello? We know they're not saved. We don't expect them to follow the dictates of God. But what about those who name the name of Christ? What about those who call themselves by his name? What about those who are professing that they know him? Jesus himself said, among those, will he even find faith? Will there be a faithful remnant left when I come? God is speaking into our day, speaking into our time. This is that day. The fulfillment of the vision that he gave to the prophet is coming a time and a day when they will encounter me. But the vision is yet for an appointed time. In the time of the end, 
in the midst of that crooked and perverse generation, in the midst of the most troubling time on the face of the earth, yet in the midst of it all, I'm going to show up in a time when men's hearts are failing them. When there are few who are faithful and even looking and desiring his coming. But God says, as a shaking, shaking, I will shake. We looked into the book of Haggai. You want to turn back over to that? <laughs> Another little book. <laughs> with another great big promise. These two passages of Scripture go hand in hand. One highlights and speaks into the other. Again, the second chapter, the only two chapters in this little prophet, in his little message, but it's not a little message, it's a power-packed message again, and it speaks directly into our day and into our time. God promises in his word that he's going to reveal himself. He's going to manifest his glory. It's a promise that he made in the word. You know the glory of the former house. We talked about Solomon's temple. I forgot the book, by the way. The next time I come, I'm going to bring it. I told my sister I was going to bring that book, Solomon's Temple. I have it. <laughs> the one I saw in Sao Paulo. And it's wonderful. It's magnificent. <clears throat> and of course, in this passage of Scripture, when he's speaking of the former house, he's speaking of Solomon's temple and the glory and majesty of the first house, and that was his presence. He came down in the midst of his people, so much so that the priests couldn't stand to minister. God's glory was in his house. And yet, God says to, to the prophet in that passage of Scripture, he says, now, look at the house in which you are now. This temple that has taken place down the period of time the first house is destroyed because of their sin. And a new temple is erected. But look at the house in which you reside. Look at the temple. And tell me honestly and truthfully how you feel, what you see. Is not this house, God says. God says. Is it not in your eyes as nothing? in comparison to the former house and the glory of the former house. How do you see this house now? And I have to be honest, you know, God posed this very question to me as I was studying his word some time ago. And I was kind of baffled by this. When I finally understood what God was saying, I realize you have seen the glory of a former house even from the time I was young. I have seen a drastic change and not for the better. I'm old enough and I've been in service long enough <laughs> to remember when worship was real worship. And when saints came into the house of God, not looking to impress anybody, not looking to, to get with anybody, they came for one purpose and one purpose and intent only, and that was they wanted to receive from God. They wanted to glorify Him, and they wanted to walk in what He had for them. And it was special when we came into the house of God. In fact, in those days, 
when I was young, before they did anything, before a chord was struck on the piano, and we had the piano in those days, <clears throat> before anybody lifted their voice to sing a song or a chorus or anything, everybody found their way to the altar of God. And we began service crying out for God. We want you, Jesus. We need you here. We can do nothing if you're not going to show up. <laughs> and that's how we began our service at the altar, seeking the face of God. God, come and move and, and work and do whatever you will. Touch lives. We want to encounter you. And we were seeking his face. And people knew how to pray in those days. They knew how to cry out in those days. They knew how to tarry in the presence of God in those days and wait until God came. Because they desired him more than anything else. And I can remember, even in my small history, in comparison, I can remember a greater day and the glory of a former house when the presence of God would come down and the manifestation of the gifts and the anointing of the Spirit. I can remember souls being saved, crying out to God. People running to the altar. We don't do that anymore. I can remember people popping up in, the, in their chair in the midst of their, the service, song service, and testifying and glorifying God, giving praise to God because they couldn't contain themselves because God's presence was so strong and his anointing was so wonderful. They couldn't help but give glory to him, testifying about his goodness. Hallelujah. I remember those days. And I remember the service after the service. You came and, and my God, the word came. And you sat on the edge of your seat. Because you wanted to know God. And you wanted to hear his word. And you were excited about what God was speaking to you. And you couldn't wait. As a young child, I got saved about 20 times. You couldn't wait to run, me, I couldn't wait to run to the altar, you know. Because I learned at a very young age, the altar is a very special place. You meet with God at the altar. And I used to say, it's the place where I meet with him. I, I don't say that anymore. It's the place now I think he meets with me. See, he calls us to that place. <laughs> and it's not just a fixed place here. But he calls us to come apart, calls us to the altar, calls us back to his presence. Come here, I've got to speak with you. I've got to do some work with you. It's the place where we did business together. The altar was a place where you did business because it's a place of death. Something dies before it's placed on that altar. Hello? Hello? And it's the place where death takes place and resurrection also takes place. Hallelujah. Because that which is dead doesn't stay dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That which died does not stay dead. Not in the altar of God. Ha. Hallelujah. Because if the same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in me, dwells in this mortal body, his word tells me that he'll quicken my mortal body. That very same spirit will also raise me to walk in resurrection power and anointing. Hallelujah. And so we see God calling back and God reminding the prophets. God speaking of another time, another place, another day. In fact, he says, do you remember the time when I came and I shook heaven in Haggai? Once more, it's a little while, he says, and I'm going to again shake, even as I shook in that day. If you go back to Exodus chapter 19, he's speaking of the day 
when he brought the children of Israel, or the time when he brought the children of Israel out of the, the land of their bondage, out of their slavery, out of Egypt. And God says, I brought you out on eagles' wings. I brought you out. I delivered you. It was my hand, by my own hand, I delivered you from your slavery, from your bondage. It all goes back to the covenant, God says, that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains with you. It all goes back to the covenant. It all goes back to the cross. The cross is central and must be central. Everything points to the cross. We are nothing apart from the cross. We are who we are. We are here in this place because of Calvary. Because of the cross. Because of the sacrifice. That sacrifice that God himself made when he brought them out of Egypt. He gave himself the spotless lamb. The only one capable of doing away with our sin. No other blood could do but that spotless, righteous blood was not just a covering for sin. Jesus didn't just cover sin. He eradicated it when he died on that cross. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. He took it upon himself. So if he took it, where is it? Where is it? That's the glory of the cross. We stand at the foot of the cross. An exchange has been made. Hallelujah. My sinfulness, my sinful, filthy nature is nailed with him on that cross. The cross is not just a picture to me of death, but it is life. Amen. It is life. It is my life. Because he took my sinful nature upon himself when he died on that cross. I died with him. When he died, I died. Paul said, it's no longer I who lives. An exchange was made. It's Christ who now lives. Christ's life in and through. It's supposed to be. Not preached like that anymore in the church. But it's supposed to be. We are supposed to be living the life of Christ. If we are truly in Christ, and we are supposed to be in Christ, in fact, Paul says, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Him. <laughs> the body is dead because of sin, but alive because of righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He who knew no sin, spotless, eternal Lamb of God, righteous, took my sin, he who knew no sin, became sin for me in order that I might 
become the righteousness of God in him. If we come to the cross, we give our life, our all. I'm dead. <laughs> As you died, I died. This is the covenant that we make with God. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ now lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He living his life in and through me. Our bodies don't belong to us anymore. Hallelujah. 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 I belong to him. He purchased me. He ransomed me. He redeemed me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I belong to him. Hallelujah. He now lives in and through me. In Christ. In Christ. I'm in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Therefore, all that he is, all that he is, and all that he has, is mine. I'm in him. He's in me. We are one. I am now a partaker, the Bible says, of the divine nature. Boy, if we knew that and walked in the reality of that. And if you allowed that revelation to get a hold of you, why do we allow Satan to speak lies to us? Why don't we stand on the truth of God's word. Why don't we really believe the scripture? We live so beneath what God has for us. We've allowed men to taint his word and alter scripture. And we look at experience and say, oh, well, I don't feel like, so it mustn't be. But God's word is God's word. And God sees our plight. He knows our state. And he says, I'm going to one more time. Oh, hallelujah. The love and mercy of God doesn't leave us in that place. Even when we should know. When we should know. God said, one more time. One more time. I'm going to come down. And I'm going to reveal myself. One more time. I'm going to call them back. Because they left their first love. Because they have wandered and they have gone astray. That's the Laodicean church. That's the Laodiceans. Longing after the things of the world. Desiring. As if there's anything in the world that is desiring. Apart from him. When you really have encountered God. And you really have come into relationship with him, is there anything in the world that can even hold a, a glimmer, a glint uh, beyond me? But you know what that tells me? When people desire the world more than they desire him, they really haven't encountered him. Because if you really have encountered him, believe me, you, you, it's hard for me to become comfortable 
in mundane worship. And it's difficult for me to be among believers who really are not solidified in their faith and have a hard time believing God and, and who are wishy-washy. It's very difficult for me. I have a difficult time when I go into some places and they don't honor God and they are questioning the move of God and the spirit of God and, and all things. And we, they should know better, but But this is the heart of God, even though they should know. Because I love them. And because he will have a church. He will have a body of believers who will walk before him in his power and his anointing. He doesn't leave us in that place, thank God. That's the glory of this message. But it comes with great responsibility. Like the prophet, we must prepare ourselves. We've got to be ready to receive. You have to have a heart and a spirit that is willing. Am I, I keep moving it away, I know. I forget. I'm too animated. Uh, so I'm sorry if you're, you're not getting all this message. Praise the name of Jesus. But thank God. He doesn't leave us in that place. He says, yet once more, I'm going to shake like I shook in that day when they came out of Egypt, I brought them to the mountain desiring that they would come into communion and intimacy with me. I called them, but a Moses alone with Joshua went up. The people were so afraid when God came down on the mountain, they ran away. Many today don't want to get too close to the presence of God. We come to God at a, a distance. They ran away because although they had come out of Egypt, Egypt had not come out of them. And I believe that's the problem in the church today. Many have come into what they say is the church, believing they have, because they have prayed a prayer at an altar, that they are now part of this group who call themselves by his name, but yet they're not changed. They don't desire him. They're still longing after the thing. You see, although they may have seemingly come out of Egypt, because we're supposed to, Egypt is the type of the world. It's a picture of us when we come to Christ. He calls us out. My covenant is not with Egypt. My covenant is not with the world. I desire you to come out from among them. You got to come out from them and come in to me in order to receive what I have for you. So they come through the Red Sea, through the sacrifice of the Lamb, with the blood on the doorpost. They see the miracle working power of God come into the desert, come to the place where God says, okay, I'm going to solidify our relationship. I'm coming down and you must encounter me. And they become so terrified when they see the thunderings and hear, I mean, they hear the thunderings and they see the lightning and the, the cloud and the smoke and the, it's overwhelming. And Moses was terrified. Make no bones about it. He was 
terrified. But the fear that Moses had caused him to draw near to God. <laughs> he didn't bring me here to, to, to destroy me. God hadn't brought us here to destroy us. He wants to heal us. He's going to heal me. If you'll come in, he'll heal you. He's going to reveal himself to you. You're going to know him in all of his glory. He's not going to hide any part of himself from you. So come up. I hear the voice of the Spirit speaking. Come up here. Come up here. You can't receive what I have from, for you down there. You've got to come up to a higher place, a greater place, a place you've never been before. You've got to come up here. Like he spoke in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Come up here. Come up here, John. I've got something that I need to reveal to you. I've got something I need to show you. This is what God is speaking to us this morning. Come up here. Come up higher. Come away. Away from all of this. Come out from among them. Be separate. This is the word God is speaking to us. Come out. Come in. Come up. Come up. Higher. Higher. Where I am. That where I am, Jesus said, there you may be also. So come up where I am. Come out from all of the clutter, the noise, and the distraction. And come up into my presence. Come up so you can receive from me. I have a heart to reveal to you. I have secrets and intimacies that I long to share with you. So you've got the desire to come up. God is calling us to that very place. To come up. Come out. This is the covenant. This is the covenant. The sacrifice of the blood that washes, cleanses, heals, delivers. brings us into communion, relationship, intimacy with God. And he re desires that we would walk before him, that we would know him. But we must come up and come in in order to receive The parallel passage to this scripture in Haggai is found in the book of Hebrews. I love Hebrews. It's one of my favorite, favorite uh, books in the, in the scripture. In the 12th chapter, the book of Hebrews, it has this very account. Speaks of this very thing. God says yet once more, <laughs> and I'm going to shake the heavens, and the earth. In that day, he shook the earth. But he says, there's coming a day. There's coming a time when I'm going to speak again because in Hebrews it says that the shaking is a result of, the God, of God's voice. God is speaking. And as God speaks, the earth shakes. As God speaks, heaven quakes at the sound of his voice. And God is speaking, and God is calling, and God is longing and desiring for us. That's the whole reason for this passage of Scripture. I want to reveal myself 
I want to pour out my presence and my glory among you. And I'm going to shake. Don't refuse he who speaks, Hebrews says. Don't refuse him when he calls. Don't refuse his voice. Answer him. Be attentive to him. This is the day in which we find ourselves. This is the reason for our coming together. It's his eternal plan and purpose that he desires you and I that he may fulfill his word. The last chapters of Scripture are being yet written. And you th th thought the book was closed. I got news for you. God is still writing. And the last chapters that he's writing include Zoe and include my brother, include Pastor Mike, Pastor Bob, include you, include me. They include us. This last generation, how will they respond when I speak? Will they be attentive to my voice? Will they come out from among them? Will they prepare themselves? Will they be ready to receive when I pour out? Will they stand and be everything that I have called them to be? For the vision is yet for the appointed time, but in the time of the end, it will speak and it will not lie. It will hasten. Hasten to its fulfillment. That is the day in which we find ourselves. The vision is hastening on to its fulfillment. God is calling. And he's waiting. There's a passage of scripture that I love in, I believe it's the third chapter of Matthew. And I want you to go home afterwards and look up these verses and read in entirety these passages of scripture. In the third chapter of the book of Matthew, John the Baptist is speaking and he says, you know, there is one who's coming after me whose sandals I'm not even you know, worthy to unlatch the. I baptize you with water now unto repentance, but when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he goes on to say his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly thresh the wheat. He's talking about on the threshing floor. He's talking about at the end of the harvest. There is an appointed time for everything. For everything, there's a season. And for everything, there is a time. There's a time to sow. And there is a time to, to reap what has been sowed. There's a time that you plant and there's a time that you water, and there's a time when the harvest comes. And the threshing is at the end of the age. When he gathers the wheat into the threshing floor, at the end of the age, at the time of the end, the vision will speak. We're at that time. It is the end of the age. The very last of the last days. We stand on the threshold of the fulfillment of God's word. You and I are privileged to be alive now at this time. 
God purposed that you and I would be alive here, now, that we would hear his word. He would choose us to walk before him in this last day. He would choose us to reveal himself to in this last time. He would call us to himself in this last day. We are the fulfillment of his promise. He stands waiting on the threshing floor, calling us. That passage of Scripture in Haggai talks about the silver and the gold. He says, the silver and the gold is, is mine. <laughs> and in the book of uh, Mal I call him Malachi, the Italian prophet, Malachi, Malachi, <laughs> I can't help it when I read that. It's like, oh, I, ha I knew someone by that name. And it was, they're like this little Italian guy. <clears throat> but Malachi, the book of Malachi is the last, the last prophetic book in, in what we have is the Old Testament canon. And in the book of Malachi, it speaks of the offering and the silver and the gold. And God says, they, the silver is mine, the gold is mine is mine and, and God speaks of the refining fire and the and the silver and the gold will be refined and it shall come forth as pure gold and at the end in the fourth chapter of Malachi he says in that day when I make up my jewels my crowns they shall be mine they are my treasure that I have reaped from the earth they are the silver they are the gold, and it doesn't matter what you look like now or you think you look like, because when you go through the refining fire, hello, <laughs> he has a way of purifying. And that's what happens when you come into the presence of God, and that's why we must go into that place. See, that's what he did. Didn't he say that to the Laodiceans? You must receive from me. Your gold and silver, that does you no good. Buy from me, God said, gold. Buy my gold. Come on, buy from me. Your silver, your gold, I know you're in love with it. Our generation, this day, this, everybody loves it. The church is in love with silver and gold. More than they love him. We love the money. We love the, you know, stuff. We don't love him. But God says, I've had enough of your silver and gold. I've had enough of your offering. Buy from me. I've got silver. I've got gold that you know nothing about. But you're going to learn. You're going to find out. And there's only one way to obtain it. And that is you've got to come into my presence in order to receive it. Because I'm a consuming fire. And what happens in the midst of that furnace? Deliverance. Deliverance. Remember the three Hebrew children. What happened in the midst of the furnace? Did they die? No. They were tied. They went in tied. They went in bound. They went in chained. What the fire did was burn off all the chains. Burn off all the bounds. All, all the ties. They, everything that held them back and kept them was burnt off of them. That's what happens in the fire of God. In the presence of God. God says, I'm a consuming fire. No flesh will glory in my presence, so don't worry about it. I'm just calling you to come. And if you come, I'll take care of the rest. You just got to come. Listen, hear my voice, respond to my word, call, come in. I'll take care of the rest. I know what you look like. Hello. I know what you look like. I know what holds, in fact, I know better than you know what holds you and binds you. You don't even know yet what binds you and holds you and keeps you. And you won't know until you get into the fire of God and you realize, wow, I had all that wrapped up. I was so wrapped up and so consumed with this and that and the other. And you get into the presence of God and God releases you from all of that. Takes it all away. That's what happens. That's what happens. Purifies. 
fire purifies. The fire of God purifies. You got to be willing to go into that place. You got to be purified. So you don't look like you anymore. So now you're going to look like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that when you come forth, it'll be pure gold. Pure silver. Pure gold. And then you'll walk in the glory and the power and the anointing of the one who's called you. You'll reflect the glory of the one in this last day, in this last day. To reap the last of the harvest. Messengers of the covenant. He's calling for those to take their place. Come in. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what holds you back. I'm calling. If you come in, I'll do the rest. My fire will purify and make you everything you're supposed to be. But you've got to be willing to come in. You've got to meet me on the threshing floor, and you've got to allow me to do whatever I need to do. This is the word of God. We are privileged that God has called us to be here this morning. To hear the word this morning. And to respond to the voice of his spirit. We're privileged to be in this day, this hour, this very time, that God will fulfill his plan and purpose in and through us. This is the day. This is the time. Take our rightful place, sons and daughters of God, that we may walk before him as his very own. To reap the last of that harvest that we may have to lay down at his feet when he comes in the clouds of glory. We bring all of those with us. We can't come alone. We must bring others with us to him. There's a harvest. The last of the harvest needs to be reaped. There are souls who hang in the balance and you and I are called by God. Will we respond to the voice of God? Give ourselves completely, totally, withholding nothing. I will. He just wants a willing heart. A heart that is willing, that is receptive, that will stand and will be everything that he's called for his honor and for his glory. Stand together with me, will you? I'm going to ask that we would come together this morning, I'm calling under the direction of God for you to come and take your place here before the altar of God. Together we stand here in this place. How many of you heard the voice of God this morning? It wasn't just a message that you heard some guy speak. If that's all you thought it was, I'm, I feel sorry, man, because... God was speaking. How many of you are stirred in your spirit? 
say, yes, I, I sense God speaking to me. I, I feel him moving. I see the culmination of what's happening here. I know why God is leading and guiding and directing. And now I know why we're praying in these prayer meetings. And I know now what God is doing. Stirring us, drawing us, calling us, longing for us so that he may be able to fulfill his word. And that you and I would be everything he's called us to be. Lift up your hands.